Right into the Word of God, I've got a word that I believe God's given me for parents and grandparents and those that steward children today. Father, I thank you for your anointing in this house that I've already felt from the moment we walked in and we begin to worship. God, I pray right now that you would anoint the ears spiritually of parents and grandparents to hear what the Word of God or the Spirit would say. Jesus said so many times in Revelation, he who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And so I pray today that we listen with spirit ears and make changes where necessary. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, familiar scripture you know, but I want to read it. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And then he says, your sons and daughters will play a massive role in this. They'll prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. As you know, for the last 30 out of 35 years this church has existed, one of, if not the primary focus of our church has been the youth and the children. And for over 30 years, I've devoted the bulk of my time towards the youth, and for good reason. Uh, the mistake a lot of good churches make is to view youth ministry as simply one of the departments in the church, uh, a flavor of the church, if you will, or a division of the church. And that department has suffered and, and not done well for so long. I can't tell you because of the success of our youth ministry how many churches I've been to in other states that have asked for help that I've gone and they have completely failed time and time and time again at youth ministry, not knowing what to do or how to reach this generation. But I believe one of the priorities of the church of Jesus Christ, especially in the modern age, you've got to pay attention to the children and the youth and the up and coming. We are to serve and protect the future of the church. And I've said this time and time again, the top 10 churches of 1970 no longer exist. And it's because churches failed to invest in the up and coming and hear the word of the Lord for the generation. Something sometimes churches believe is that youth is something that needs to be offered. And, and it is correct in a sense to view youth and children's ministry as a certain part of the body of Christ, but it's so much more than that. The up and coming, as we refer to them, the next in line, the next generation, it takes one of two destinies historically and biblically. When we look at the coming generation, there's one of two destinies that historically has happened over and over again in generations. They either form their own opinions and completely turn from tradition to reject the truth that they've known, break away from the foundations of faith that have been built on and turn their backs on the word, and they spit upon the values and moralities of previous generations. You can even go all the way back to the Old Testament and see how that happened in different generations. Or they stand for truth when all else falls away and weakens. They build upon the foundations that were laid by their godly mothers and fathers. They fight against the schemes, the attacks, the plans, and the warrings that the enemy brings against the kingdom of God that are designed to sabotage the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. They fight wickedness that is designed to tear down values and morality and righteousness and holiness in a generation that was fought for by the blood, sweat, and tears of previous foundational generations that had a posture in life that was prayer. They either join the darkness and empower the kingdom of darkness or they shine brighter than the former generation simply because the darkness is greater and the light must increase. They either put their light under a bucket like Matthew 5 says and minimize their godliness or they shine like a city on a hill. And either of these choices are dependent upon two things that I'll talk about today. And the first one is this. Which avenue which road these generations choose that are before us are dependent upon number one the investment the support the training and love from the foundational generation you are in a church that over the last 30 years has poured their investment in the foundation of the church and when you think about those who have grown up through the youth ministry and fed this church you see the value in that. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 tells us this. Train up a child in the way he should go. 
that right there completely abolishes the notion today of, well, they'll learn their own lessons. I've heard parents say mistakenly, they'll learn when it comes to certain things that they need to be shown the way they should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. There is a gap in that scripture, meaning that sometimes we have young people that get to an old older age and they've walked away from the faith but the scripture promises when there is a a way that's been shown the way that they should go when they grow old they won't depart from that they may walk some dirt roads but i'm here to tell you right now there's a promise in the scripture that they will not depart from the faith when they grow old but they've got to be shown the way of truth in the first place Love is the reason that you begin to tell your child no. You don't want them to stick their finger in the light socket. You don't want them to exit the end of the driveway because of the cars. It's love, the reason why you begin to tell your children no. You train them up in the way they should go. And it is love that is showing them the scriptures in which they must live by. Letting them train themselves in any stage in life will spell certain disaster according to the scripture. You can read what you want to in the parenting of Google, but I'm telling you right now, look at the scripture. Train up a child in the way they should go. Don't leave them to themselves. Don't let them think that they can find their own way. Show them the way and light them the path as long as you can, even if your grandparents keep shining the light because there's a seed that may have been planted years ago in them that will spring forth in days to come. Why? Because God is not a man that he should lie. And Isaiah 55 11 said, my word will not return void. But if I told you that when your child grows old, they won't depart. If you put truth in them, then that's what's going to happen. And you got to hold to that faith. Don't lose heart of the fact that my child has gone this way or that. Listen, stop reading so much online. And why don't you just go back to the scripture first, if you want to raise a good kid. Oh, they'll learn, they'll learn. That is unscriptural. You will learn them. Train means this. Anybody get learned like I did? Hmm? I remember my grandpa saying, I'll learn you, boy. Train a child in the way they should go. There's a few children that could stand to be learned. Could I get an amen? Spare the rod. Bratinize that kid. Let him run everywhere ragging and, and disobey every rule of the house. Uh, train, the Bible says. Teach a skill or a type of behavior. You tell them, no, you don't, you don't act out like that. You don't, you don't walk according to this way. Now that's, that, those things don't come out of your mouth. A type of behavior through practice and instruction to point or aim in the right direction. The Bible actually calls your children arrows. And you're going to point them or aim them for the target, or you're going to point them or aim them for failure. To point or aim in the what? The right direction. Several translations say point, and then the one that I'm taking today says direct. See, with children and teens... You are in the director's chair. And you are forming an eternal movie that starts with you directing them at age two, even younger for some. And too many people in this culture, I hope I could get a witness, are creating a bad movie. And when we look at the current times and we talk about how dark it is, A lot of that is due to bad directing or a lack thereof. Listen, the power of the direction of the movie, this eternal movie, is in your hands to start directing them. The tone of the movie, the emotion of the movie. If you're someone that's always angry and screaming out in front of them, you are setting the emotion of this movie. They will pick up traits from you. If you are a praying daddy, if you are a worshiping mother, If you are a man of the word, they will pick up traits. If they see you, when cancer shows up at the house, say, 
Well, we hear that, but our Bible tells us in Isaiah 53, 4, and 5 that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our... Listen, we're getting through this because God said, if they see you, mother, stand up and say something like, well, that, I know that's happening in your life, but listen, the Scripture says, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. If you exude the Scripture... You are setting the tone of this eternal movie. It's what you turn to is what they will turn to. The cinematography involved in the lifestyle of this eternal movie. The actors and actresses. Listen, it won't be a lot of times just your child that goes wayward, but the young people that you allow them to hang with. The actors and the actresses that you allow to play in this movie, and you just welcome in and say, play a part in the light. Listen, stop trusting every parent out there. You can't just let your kids go out and spend the night on Friday night. You don't know what's left in that house. You don't know what they're going to say. The actors and the actresses will speak backstage to your children things that will come out in their life if you don't pay attention. There's some people that could be cut from the movie for the sake of your children. You got to pay attention to what's going on. You can't just be loose. Who's playing the supporting roles? What are those teachers saying to your children? What characters are being played in your child's life? Oh, might I go ahead and say the wardrobe you allow them to choose in this culture? <laughs> I'll preach myself. Hmm? Some of these, some of the stuff we allow our children even to wear. And I don't want to make anybody feel bad, but sometimes we dress like we're going to the YMCA when we come to the house of God. Hmm? And somebody, a parent actually said to me when we had a dress code in 180, they're like, well, we don't, I don't really have any conviction against cleavage and, and short shorts. And I said, well, just hands, the characters, the language, the lifestyles, the drama, their values, what is allowed, what is accepted, what is condoned, what is compromised in the movie determines if it will be rated G or PG or PG-13 or R. What rating are you drawing at home in this movie that you're creating with your training or your lack thereof? What props are playing a part in your movie? Let me just go ahead and preach a little bit at what is unpopular that won't gain me any popularity in my preaching today, but you're play, allowing props. Listen, we have allowed the prop of alcohol in the Christian home in today's generation like never before. And we think that because we're adults that we can just drink and we can socially drink and it's no big deal. Listen, the entire reason, let me just go ahead and make a few people mad, but I love you and you know it. The entire reason I believe the Holy Ghost is starkly against drinking Say I drink, and I can hold one beer and not get drunk, even though the highway patrol says buzz drinking is drunk driving. Even though I've asked a 45-year alcoholic, did one beer give you a... He said, oh, heck yes, one beer will calm me right down and give me a little bit of a feel after drinking for 45 years. So say I can drink one beer and hold my alcohol and not get drunk. What happens when one of my precious 180 students who just found Christ and went to Holy Spirit filled Camp 180 sees me sitting at... Texas Roadhouse throwing one back. I'll tell you what happens. What you whisper, your kids will scream. And that young person sees, well, Pastor Devin drank. What do you think they're going to do with their 18-year-old flesh that has no control when they go to spring break? What you whisper, your children will scream. I want to tell you right now that my testimony is a testimony of no alcohol. You want to talk about, well, God brought me out of this ditch, and now, listen, I didn't have to go in the ditch because I had a dad that trained me and said, son, you don't touch the stuff. We don't look at the stuff. It brings nothing but debauchery. The Bible says there's nothing good that can come from that. You can drink it and completely lose who you are and start making different choices. He said, son, it's like taking the control of the spirit in your life and passing it over to the flesh, and you begin to make decisions according to the flesh. So what props are you going to allow in this movie? Ah, well, you know, drinking is just a compromise that's hot in the church world right now. It wasn't 30, 40 years ago. We didn't even deal with it. But Jesus said it would happen in Scripture in the last days. Maybe you never considered it this way. When you look at Matthew 24, 38, for is in the days before the flood, 
They were eating and drinking, not lemonade, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. It mentions it as one of the reasons for the ark. Why would the Word of God even mention it if it weren't a cause for the debauchery of mankind, ultimately leading with the symptoms that caused God to consider and even follow through with wiping out mankind and starting over? People want to say it's just a gray area, this prop that we allow in our home. But they choose to be blind to the obvious within Scripture. Luke 17 even says it like this. They ate, they drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. Drinking in these Scriptures translates into indulgent lifestyles. Sensual, drink, indulgent. It's all through the Word of God. And that's just one prop. That I chose to pick today. See, in the movie, you're directing. You're in this director's chair. You have the power. You get to choose the props that play a, a part in the destiny of your child's life, from smartphones to R-rated movies in the home. I'm not against smartphones, but I wouldn't give one to an 8-year-old. And I would filter Internet. I'm just trying to help you today. Because I've seen the lives of young people for 30 years, and I've seen them grow old. I've been in this long enough to see three waves of young people come through in all their schooling, all the way through. And I've seen them come back at age 34 and 35 and say, Pastor Devin, everything that you told was truth, and I wish that I would have listened. The R-rated movies in the home that we think are just nothing, and maybe the kids are busy, and they're listen, they're listening. And if you watch them at home, they're watching them at their friend's house, and they're watching them on their phone, and they're streaming them on every device because you watch them. Boundaries are there because we love. A prop of alcohol, if it was okay for daddy, it must be okay for me. One in three people have an addictive personality. Maybe you were fine with it, but your child would be the alcoholic. Then there's music and internet. Hmm? But there's props like scripture that you begin to speak to them when they're even old enough to hear in their ears. You, you can preach with me this morning. There is worship. Listen, when you come down here and you lift your hands and you begin to worship, they follow you and they worship. They see you kneel at prayer tonight when we have prayer in the house corporately. Listen, go into the house of God on Sunday morning and Sunday night. Could I get a witness in the house? And coming back for more on Wednesday night. And, and, and props like leadership and showing them the respect. Listen, it's not a case of what you or they will miss out on if I'm wrong concerning a prop in the play of life like maybe wine, beer, or alcohol. They miss out on some parties. Uh, maybe transferring the control of flesh from the spirit into the hands of their own flesh by indulging in it, near misses with danger, missing out on temptation or destruction or worse. It's more about what you may miss out on if I'm right about it. Exactly. Consider the props that are allowed in the director's cut, parent. Ecclesiastes and 2 Corinthians tells us that we will be rewound and our eternity will be played back in eternity in front of the executive producer. So with the children in mind that I am a steward over, I'm working hard to please the producer. And doing that, listen, I don't do anything that takes away from the house of the Lord. Could I get an amen? Huh? I'm directing this movie, stewarding these kids in my house. I'm making a blockbuster movie with my children that will propel them to change the world around them. Listen, you get to choose the background music to this movie. You know, music is a major, major role in the lives of your children. And I talk about it almost weekly in 180 because I believe since Lucifer was in charge of music in heaven, he uses music... So subtle in this generation, but it's a major weapon in his hands. Hmm? Our young people, their emotions are charged by music. If you don't think that's the case, they don't play Amazing Grace when the chiefs come out on the field. They play something that moves all the people. Hmm? When I train, I, I'm not listening to 
You're more than able. I worship to that. I listen to something that will blow your face off and scream your face off because I need something that will make my blood boil when I start hitting a heavy bag or start doing whatever I do. Emotions are charged by music. And young people sometimes live their lives according to their emotions. Sometimes the direction of their emotions is driven by the music they listen to. And so I want to say this. Check their music regularly and help them to make a change. I want you to know that on, one, on the app, you click on 180, there's the 180 playlist. And music in every style that's Christian today. When I was a kid, my parents hardly had anything to direct me to. We didn't have much back in the day. I've said this before. But we had Carmen and Petra. That's about it. And maybe Striper, Harry. There wasn't much, but now the talent that's been released in the kingdom of God, I want to tell you this right now. There is no reason on planet earth that a young person raised in a Christian home should be listening to frequently the top 40 music of today. No reason whatsoever. And I'm going to tell you why. You say, well, you know, that just sounds like a churchy thing to say. The Bible says that your very faith comes from your hearing. Your hearing is what brings faith into your soul. When you hear the word of God, just like music, your faith is charged. And so if faith comes by hearing, you need to pay attention to that one little earbud they walk around with all the time. Because if faith comes by hearing, so does every other spirit and every other temptation and every other directing of the enemy. I want you to know that one of the greatest enemies of, of our world today that the enemy speaks through is that little AirPod that they walk around with all the time because they're half listening to you half listening to the truth and the word of God sometimes but 24 7 they're listening to the top 40 and what everybody else has to say about every issue about love about sex about life about drinking about anything that is foundational to their life it comes through those ears check what they're listening to and help them course correct you get to choose the locations that this movie's filmed in. I said earlier, getting ahead of myself, you better pay attention to where you let your children go. I've never seen a generation as more free and driving around and hopping in cars and going place to place, and then you say, where have you been? They don't have much to say. Stop trusting every other parent and every other family and pay attention. Thank you for those amens in here. Might have some nervous people or some nervous kids in here, but I'm going to tell you right now, it'll save the course of this movie. Hmm? Hmm. Showing your kids what sport or activity trumps God and his house on Sunday, or instead of showing them God first all the time. Huh? I want to say right now, it, it's really hard to get Christian folk to think like that. But if we were back on Mount Sinai and God was showing up like a volcano at the top of the mountain, you'd grab your few and you'd get your butt to the house of God. If he was physically right there calling you by the presence of God that caused men to drop dead, it'd be a little different. But now it's a little tough. There's so many things pulling us in every busy direction. If I act like I'm a man on purpose, it's because I've been with your children for 30 years. I have a right to speak like I speak today. I've stayed in the hot place, the blacksmith place, forming weapons and putting weapons in the hands of young people for 30 years, and that's a hot place. Nobody wants to do it all the time. Nobody wants to be there, and we have a lot of staff that do it on Wednesday nights, but we are putting weapons in the hands of future warriors Sometimes staying in the hot place pays off in the battle, and I'm telling you it is in this church right now. Letting them make their own decisions on these matters at any age while under your stewardship is not the same as you would do for them in any area of life otherwise. After all, with every decision you make as the director, because the Bible says you're the trainer, you're the pointer, you're the director, you are doing everything you can to help decide the ending of this movie. If your children are nearly grown, and maybe you've done everything that you could and the movie is taking an unexpected twist and they're not following the path that you laid down. Take courage. Proverbs said, when they grow old, they will not depart. 
Maybe you're sitting in here today and the training you've administered needs some editing. How about today you talk to the greatest editor of eternity films in history, and that is the Holy Spirit, and say, how can you help me, Holy Spirit, to direct these children better? For any stage in life, can I get a witness in here, God always has an alternative ending. He always has an alternative ending. How many people in this room could wave at me and say, had it not been for a praying parent or praying loved ones, I was headed for certain destruction. But there was an alternate ending in the plans that God had for my life. And in his prevenient grace, at one point, he course corrected. And I would have been another way. But my life is now ending in the right path. He always has an alternate ending. God steps in and does that. Many, many characters started out in the God in a dark path and then they course corrected later in the movie. Look at Saul. Look at the woman at the well. These are promises in the Word of God that if you're directed your child in the ways of the Lord and they walked away in this movie, Isaiah 43, 5 and 6 says, Fear not, I'm with you in this. I'll bring your descendants from the east and I'll gather them from the west. And then I love it says, I will say to the north, give them up. If your children are far out, God says, I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, don't keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. God said he'd do it. He says it again in Jeremiah. There is hope in your future, says the Lord in this movie, that your children shall come back to their own border. So if you raise your children and they walked away, you begin to speak these scriptures out loud over their life. Thank God for a ministry like 180. Bus drivers that show up on Wednesday night, even if there's a few kids on the bus or if it's a full bus. We had 50 students from Halstead on the bus this last Wednesday night. Thank God for a place like 180. 56 adult staff that show up on Wednesday night and give up where they could be over listening to a great message from Pastor Mike, but they give up that specializing in helping produce alternate endings for young people in their lives. So many young people that would never known the gospel of Jesus Christ and would have otherwise met a tragic ending because every ending, every eternity is tragic without Christ. It says that in 1 John chapter 5. If you have the Son, you have life. But if nobody has the Son, you don't even have a life. The ministry of 180 administers life to students. They drive a bus or ride a bus when it's, when it's inconvenient or uncomfortable. Riding a bus when it was 115 degree heat index this last week or last summer or whatever. And here we are October, and it's 95 degrees today. Could we get a break, Lord? <laughs> These people show up to help, and I'm so thankful for them, and people like you get behind the vision of life, life that they can have if they know the Son. We've decided to be a church of first responders in this emergency situation of American young people. Trapped in a scene in their movie. Sometimes they are trapped in a scene in the movie that they created for themselves, but a lot of times they're trapped in a scene they were born into. And a little bit of truth coming on a bus and hearing that Christ has a better life for them is all that they need. And I am asking everyone today to consider being a helper in this first responder for this church that is, we're building a new building. And I know that's a focus, but we can't lose the focus of where we've come from and the foundation we've built on, which is the young people and the youth, not only for our children, but listen, supporting the mission of 180 as a seed for your children by supporting those who without 180 have no godly truth in their lives. So back to my main point to finish up. This generation either chooses to stand for the truth or they turn from the truth based on two things. We discovered, number one, it was the investment, support, training, and love from the foundational generation and then perhaps the one that holds the most weight is number two. They choose that path based on the heart of the generation that either turns towards God or away from them. What heart does this generation have? Because ultimately, and sometimes even though guided by godly leaders and parents, it is the decision of the generation themselves, the teens, the up and coming to decide to stand and fight and win after they've received the truth. After all, David was a man after God's own heart, but then Absalom ended up turning his back on God and his father. 
Adam walked with God in person through the cool of the day, but his son became a murderer. It's up to the generation to choose who they're going to be, follow after their foundational fathers or turn away. What is the heart that they have? The kings, the judges of the Old Testament, a godly king, and then an unrighteous king rises up and rejects the God of his fathers. The heart of this generation, where does it stand? Well, I'm going to tell you. I've been in this playing long enough to see three waves, as I said before, of young people come through. And today I put my spiritual stethoscope on this generation. And I've seen this generation firsthand for quite some time. And although you have a handful of knuckleheads that, that kind of have a trouble finding their spiritual legs, and you got to wait on them, the majority of this generation has a heart turned towards God like no other generation before. And so I declare and I tell you, this is a Joshua generation. A generation unafraid of giants that we face. They'll walk into the coming times that we see as bleak and dark and say, yes, they are giants in the land, but we are well able to conquer them through God. This is a Josiah generation. He began his reign at age eight and rediscovered the word of God. In 2 Kings 22, it says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right hand or the left. This is a Samuel generation. And Samuel, just a teenager in the house of God and serving, and God began to call to him audibly. It says, the Lord came and stood there, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. God went on to say, I'm about to do something in your generation, Samuel, and I believe he's calling this generation like none other. This is a David generation. Can I get somebody to shout yes? Not afraid of the giants of politics, not afraid of the giants of laws or a culture that turns from God, I believe that they will stand against the giants who defy God in America when the rest of the church world hides behind the bush of religion for fear while the Goliaths of our day call out. But just like David rejected Saul's armor, I believe this generation rejects man's false armor called religion because they're clothed in the mighty presence of God and the Holy Ghost. I believe praise goes before this generation as did with David and faith hurls the rock that will slay the giants of their day this generation is a generation after God's own heart and listen I'm putting my money on this generation and today in a small way I ask you to do the same the devil knows and sees that this generation has been spoken over this up and coming. He sees the power in their praise, the fierceness in their prayers, the unabandoned in the Holy Ghost. He sees they will pray. He sees that his territory is threatened and defeat is imminent. You might say, Pastor Devin, as the director of my movie, for the first few years of my children's life, it started out R-rated. One or more of my children may struggle because of of my ways. I didn't direct as well as I could have in areas. Or maybe you say, I truly have tried to direct in godly ways with all my heart. Sure, I could have done better in different areas, but for the most part, I stood solid in my child's struggles to find their heart for God. I have two words for you today. Take heart. In the bonus material of this movie, there is an alternate ending for your child. God has them. We pray a hedge about them. We have a promise. They may fall into some ditches in their life and become stubborn, but we have a promise that when they grow old, they'll not depart. So today, I say, and I'm asking you to give any money today. I'll explain in just a moment. This is very small. It's nothing large. A lot of times in churches, children and youth ministry are given down to, but things that we look up to, we give up to. If you take an offering for young people or for children, a lot of times the dollar bills are there. But sometimes in churches you get an evangelist comes through and they've got a name. We give the hundreds there. And we never see the effect of that tree that we've given to and the fruit that comes. And there's times when we have to do that. Matter of fact, in this month, we have our missionary Jim King coming from the Ukraine. And I would ask you to bring an offering for that. The war that's gone on over there and the orphanage that we, that we support, all that, our giving has a place in every area of the kingdom of God. But in this church, 
We don't give down to the youth or the children. We know that God's taking this generation up, and so we give up to them. We at least give $2. No, I'm just kidding. We give up. So I say start by sowing a seed in the ministry that concentrates on backing up the training that you're already doing at home. Maybe sowing a seed for your children or for your grandchildren. For your children that are at home now and young, maybe five years old. Or maybe sowing a seed for someone that is older and they've walked away. Just believe in God for that promise to come from Isaiah and Jeremiah. Perhaps it may be just the training that you start now. Making some editing changes. Let God create for you an alternate ending for your kids by maybe the seed you sow today. And I'm asking every person in this room to just invest in the up and coming in a small way, children and youth. I get emails all the time. I don't know why, but I get emails about investing in a movie that's coming out. And they say there's movies. I got one just the other day. If I invest in an American movie or invest in a European movie, that I would get 128% return over 24 months in the new movie coming out. You know, that can go either way. Any investment can, but this investment, the returns are backed by God and His Word, and it will not return void. In a sense, we've been in a building program for 30 years. When you think about the power of 180, it's one thing to build a building, and we'll rejoice in that day in just, in just the months and years to come. It's another thing to build His church. Jesus looked at Peter and said it like this, and I'm going to close. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the revelation he'd received that you're the son of the living God. Upon this rock of this revelation, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Peter never built a building, but what Peter did was build the church. Young believers in Christ who formed the future church, and were building that through 180. Every few weeks having a turn life graduation, which are young people that go in and go into a little deeper discipleship and, and give up part of their hang time to learn more about Christ. Even after the message of the night, the worship that we have, the Camp 180 that is incredible, move of God. A great percentage of today's Ark Church came up through 180 because of our founding pastor and the vision of this church and what God put in our hearts. And now their children are the up and coming. Did you know that out of the 56 adults that we have working 180 right now, 43 of them came up through 180? Another 11 have been in that vision for 15 to 26 years. It's a darn good percentage for building the future. Some of your children are a couple years away from 180. Why not sow a seed in the future? Today, every penny that you pledge will go to outreach, Bibles, turn life discipleship, the outreach, the buses that go. Let me tell you what outreach is. Diesel at over $4 a gallon. That's outreach in America. Bus, parts, and repairs. And I will say this. I thank God for Brother Jim Sod. He has such a great passion for the bus ministry. I've never seen a man get more excited over a bus than Jim Sod. He calls me out of breath, and I think he's won the lottery, but he's found a bus, and thank God we outbid everyone, and we just bought this brand new bus for 180 in the Ark Church. We won, and this is a 71-passenger bus with only 87,000 miles on the diesel engine. It is beautiful. Jim Sod got a sleeping bag and slept in it the night that we won. No, I'm just kidding. He loves it. And I thank God for his passion and those that help him, or Stephen and different ones. And then uh, our my brother from, from AutoSmart, Scott, went with him down three hours away. They drove. They checked it out. They plugged it into a computer. We just bought this bus for $6,800, and it was a great, great deal. We won it. It'll go toward that. You want to be a part of that bus and like Halstead, Wednesday night, good Lord, we weren't even ready for what, we, what showed up from Halstead. Over 50 kids from the Halstead school system. Hmm. When that bus is full of young people like that, I want you to have a part in it somehow. In the 180classic.com, and this is, we're going to finish up today. 180classic.com, if you can pull that website up real quick. This is where you register to play disc golf, and I'd encourage you to do it. If you can throw a Frisbee, you can play disc golf. That $20 for your registration is a little over a dollar a hole. 
it, it helps. So team of four, you register on there for 20 bucks. But then as you scroll through, you can also click on uh, sponsorships if you want to become a sponsor. And basically that takes you to the business page. So if you have a business, maybe today you can't give or maybe you're going to make a pledge, you can convince a business to be a part of that. And we display the business on the website. We also display it on the tournament. And there's great things you can get involved in. But today... What we do every year, and we've done this for 15 years at 180, so this isn't anything new. We skipped a couple of years because of doing our building program kickoff this last year. But all we ask is if you want to be individually a sponsor and help us in buying that bus, is that you take a $100 pledge over the next 90 days. And when you do that, your name gets on a real estate sign that we put at every hole. It might be, we call it a green sponsorship, but you get uh, your name put there that you are a sponsor of 180 in the bus ministry, and it's $100 over 90 days. That's it. We're not asking for any more. don't want you to do any more. Maybe you can give that today. You can plop that in. That's great. We'll make sure that your name is put on one of those signs, or maybe you need three months to gather that hundred dollars. You can give twenty bucks here, twenty bucks there. That's all going to go towards this new bus that we just bought. And I couldn't allow an opportunity for blessing to pass by the Ark Church. This is how God blesses His children: when you sow into something that's going to bring fruit. Listen, this is fruit on wheels. Could I get an amen? So today. If you can do that, we appreciate that because today that's what it's all about, and that keeps us afloat. Everybody doing something, maybe for your child, maybe for your grandchild, just sowing a seed that God continues to direct them. Or maybe you become a business sponsorship. You can look those up. Today, when you leave, if you want to become a business sponsor or take one of these, this tells you all of the business sponsorships. Also, you can take some of these player cards and just give them to somebody that, you know, maybe they want to play with you. It's two weeks from today. After church, we will eat Team Delicious homemade Monterey's, and then we will go and play at Millbrook Park, which is just about 10 minutes from here, and uh, we'll raise money enough, I believe, to buy that bus in cash. Could somebody say amen? So the way that you do this today is just to, in just a moment, I'm going to pray, and if you're interested in making a pledge, again, you don't have to give any money today. You can put 100 bucks in there. You can do it on the square just or, or on the app or on the iPad over here just by selecting 180 and giving that $100, or you can give it out through the next three months. Or today, what we want you to do in a moment after I pray is you raise your hand. They're going to bring you an envelope, and just on that envelope, mark your name like you would want it on the sign, and then $100 pledge. Whether there's money in it or not, we're going to make a sign by faith that you're going to keep that, that pledge. And just write your name and $100 on that envelope, and we'll know that you're in for helping us buy this bus. Because look, God's doing something when we can get 50 kids to jump on a bus. And that's one bus. We run several buses on Wednesday night. So I believe getting behind this, listen, this is the building program. We're building the future church. Our young people need a place of truth just like every other spirit-filled adult needs. And this is our children, too. One-way students ride the bus on Wednesday night for the first through fifth grades as well. I realize that we're in a building program where we're already giving towards this, but this is a very small pledge and a small way to keep going what we're already doing. And I believe God will put it in your hands. Many of you have done this for several years, and this is your opportunity. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I thank you, first off, for every parent Lord, that's in this house doing the right thing by being in the house of God. Every grandparent that still has a a, a light to shine to their grandkids. God, I pray right now over them that maybe there's some editing changes that could take place, whatever it may be, that you cause us to go home and maybe start looking at some things in the way that we've done stuff to make sure that we're following Scripture or that we're doing everything we can to point them or direct them in the right path that they should go so that when they grow, they'll not depart. I also pray over every wayward young person. Lord, every couple of months, we bring this before you. Every person trying to find their way, those seeds that were planted in them as a young boy or a young girl, God, we pray that you would cause them to come alive like spring flowers in water and rain. God, let something begin to rise up, letting them know that I had a place at the table back at my father's house spiritually. I pray, God, that you would bring them back from the far country. God, 
Stand up off your throne today for these that are under the sound of my voice and call back their young daughters and sons from the north and say, give them up. God, let them come back to their faith and find their faith. Maybe if it's not here, that's fine, but send someone to where they are and let them find faith where they are. God, we're fine with that as long as we know their destiny and their ending in this bonus material is an alternate ending. Devil, you have no say in their life. In the mighty name of Jesus, we echo back what you say in your word, and we say, give them up. They belong to the kingdom of God. There's a mark on them. I thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. And now today for these people that raise their hand by saying, I'd like to get in on this. I want to be a part of one of those 71 seats on that bus. I want to be a part in this fruit that's so visible that I can see it happening before my eyes on Wednesday nights when those buses are rolling to these school systems. And I pray, God, that as they raise their hand, that you would give them the faith to say that over the next 90 days, I know I can come up with 100 bucks for these children and young people. Or maybe for a couple college students that say, hey, let's do 50 apiece together, you and I. Maybe some teenagers say, I want to jump in on this. Let's the three of us, let's do this. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would just empower us with faith today. Lord, by your word, we know that you bless. And God, I thank you for those that may become a business sponsor, a tea sponsor for $150 or more. I thank you, Lord, for those that pledge. I pray blessing over those businesses right now. I don't even know who they are, but I thank you, God, for a blessing that comes upon them instantly. And God, we'll recognize and be careful to give you the praise and we see it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, online audience, for joining us today. If you- thank you for watching our service this morning. The Ark is truly a voice for truth in these times. We hope you felt the presence of God as you joined us today. If you prayed the prayer of salvation, text the word salvation to 316-333-2890. We would love to know you prayed with us and we want to connect with you. Also, if you're within driving distance, we'd love to have you join us in person. Our congregation is now taking a moment to further the truth of the gospel through giving. If you were touched today, will you take a moment and sow into this live stream? Simply scroll to the top of our Facebook page and click donate or you can donate online at arcchurch.net. We're sending out the word of God twice a week and people are watching all over the world. Like and follow us on social media and even subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single service. God bless you for joining us today. We'll see you next time.